Welcome to Audio Technology Magazine's ISO Booth Podcast, where we phone audio engineers and producers at home, and thanks to the pandemic lockdown, they answer. Hey everyone, welcome to another Audio Technology Magazine ISO Booth. Today I welcome Joe Solo, producer, muso, songwriter of considerable note. Uh, His production talents are responsible for more than 34 million records sold worldwide. Welcome to Audio Technology's ISO Booth, Joe. Hi, it's good to be here. I'm excited to uh, be talking with you. And uh, thanks, yeah, thanks for joining us from uh, sunny SoCal, I guess. Is that where you're at at the moment? I guess it's sunny. I haven't been outside in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all we're all uh, cooped up, but um, there's still lots that we can be getting on with as uh, as producers, oh, yeah. as, isn't it? Um, what are you, what are you being uh, messing around with um, in the last few weeks? Oh man, all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm working with this hip hop artist named Black Nitty, and we're doing. I like to create like a signature sound for each artist I work with and also try and push the envelope stylistically. So we're going to have some pretty classic hip hop rhythm elements, but we're going to lace the production with some really cool electronica sonics and then craft the whole Mm. thing using hip hop right songwriting sensibilities. Cool. Cool. So. Yeah, which I guess leads me straight in um, to I want to talk to you about, I guess, the art of production. I guess we can um, currently uh, a producer is uh, in the modern vernacular is somebody who, you know, produces the music mostly in the box. Uh, all cool. But um, it wasn't so long ago that a, a producer was something else. And, um, and I know that you're um, from an era, I guess. Let's let's not be too delicate about it. That where the producer was a very different animal to a producer today. I just wanted uh, if you could talk us through, I guess, some of the more classical um, or classic uh, uh, production um, tools in your bag that you maybe can, um, uh, I guess, sort of convey to our readers who sure, may not be aware sure. of that. I- I've got a lot of, I've developed a lot of techniques, and, and, and people can develop their own if, if they're working with other people. It's, mm. it, it, it's, and this ties in with the whole understanding their music and them understanding, you know, use a producer. It's, it's a relationship, and it has to be built like every relationship mm. on trust. Mm-hmm. Sure. Because, you know, they're taking material that they've written a long time ago. Or maybe it's brand new and we're writing it together, mm. but it's 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 a baby of theirs or or ours, mm. and you know uh, everyone is very precious about their baby for sure. And to say you know okay here's my baby now I'm going to hand it over to you Joe, mm. and I'm going to trust you know mm. that that you're going to take it there, mm. take yes. it all away, mm. make it undeniable, mm. undeniable from the beginning. Of the very first note to the very last pow or mm. fade or mm. however you end the song. Yep. Um, so I've got a bunch of human tricks to get good performances out of performers. Yep. And this is especially true with vocalists. Um, when, and if you have a lot, a lot of artists I develop are new artists because new talent is the lifeblood of the music industry. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them haven't been with a seasoned producer before, Mm -hmm. or maybe they haven't been in a recording environment that's really pristine sounding. And they're used to mics in the club that don't pick up all the spit noises and tongue clicks and other things. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you get them in the studio and like they can freeze, you know. So you have to set a nice, hey, it's okay, you know, relaxing vibe, light some candles, turn down the lights if it's a ballad, um, and and just have them to just I just get them in front of the mic and mm-hmm. so you just start warming up. Mm-hmm. And of course I record all this stuff because a lot of times 
since they're not thinking or caring about it too much, yep. their warm ups sure. are, 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 they're coming out with great, you know, nuggets yeah, of yeah. music. And, um, so, so that's sort of one of the tricks is to record them when they don't think it's like officially on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And by the same token, uh, if I'm working with say a vocalist and they're getting really frustrated because they just can't, you know, get, get in their flow or whatever reason, sometimes I'll take the hit for them. Meaning like if they do like a, a really bad take, and it's bad take after bad take, uh, just to like break the monotony. You know, we'll take a break and we'll have conversations about nothing to do with music and get their mind off of it, and then bring them back in, and and, and that seems to help mm. a lot mm. because it gets it's, it interrupts that thought process where they're so stuck in this mindset of, oh my goodness. What I sing right now mm. will be embossed in the ears of the world mm. for the rest of the history of history. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> With that kind of pressure, self-induced pressure, how are you going to, you know, relax? And yeah. this should be fun and it yeah. should flow, you know. So, or sometimes uh, if, if they're doing, you know, a bad take or they can't seem to achieve something, you know, we're trying to achieve – Sometimes I'll just tell them I need another one because I forgot to hit record. I hit, mm. you know, something like that. It's, yep. It may not be true, sure. but just to take the focus off of their current mental state. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Now, an another good technique for capturing vocals is... A lot of a lot of people I notice record linear, like from the song from beginning to end. Mm. Uh, um, but what I suggest is trying to do all like parts at the same time. Okay. So maybe start out with uh, maybe even start out with the cor the choruses, and knock out the first chorus. And then instead of and then go to the next chorus and while they're in that flow, while you have the signal and the tone set up for that, because those can be changed in different parts to make more dynamic recordings. Mm. Um, and then you do the second chorus. Mm. And then we do the choruses at the end. Yep. And what I notice is by the time we get to the last set of choruses. They're much more warmed up and in their groove. Mm -hmm. And so I'll say, look, you sound so great at the end of the song. Mm -hmm. I think we need to go back and do the first chorus again. Yep. So that lives up to the greatness that you're doing now, because mm -hmm. now it's really cooking. Mm -hmm. You know, you're really cooking. Mm -hmm. You're in your groove. Let's do it. So, yeah, OK, great. Let's do it. We go back and we knock out the first chorus. And then it's like, hey, now we got the first and third chorus sounding great. Let's not be lazy. Let's you, you're in the groove. Let's hit the second chorus. Sure. And then we do the same thing with the verses and the bridges and whatever other parts. Yep. Um, yep. Good tip. And I find it's much easier for everyone to just focus on one part type at a time mm -hmm. instead of having to completely change the vibe. And dynamic live mm, mm. from verse to chorus to verse, et, mm. et cetera. Mm. And then also, like I mentioned before, a lot of times, d depending on the material and the voice, a lot of times I will uh, suggest setting up a different level and compression setting mm. that matches the verse better than the chorus, since mm. choruses tend to be louder and more impactful and punchy mm. so um mm. yeah for sure but this did just a lot of there's a lot of engineers that'll say something like uh sing the loudest point in the song mm. and they'll set the level to make sure it doesn't you know yep. go too far over yep um for that and then record the song and they're not getting nearly as much signal 
They're yeah. not taking advantage of the bit depth and the, and the tonality that they can get sure. by doing it one section at a time. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah it's, I hear you. Yeah. Have you got any tips for, uh, you know, vocal doubles, like getting vocalists to uh, do doubles well? Is that a, 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 an issue for you in the, in the studio at times? Um, I don't have too, I don't really have too many problems with it. it. It's very, it's very difficult for a vocalist to line up, uh, their S's and their T's, mm. um, and B's and P's mm. really, really a lot of hard, a lot of hard consonant sounds. But, um, so let's say we have a lot of S words mm. and we've doubled or tripled something. Mm. I'll go in afterwards and I will delete a lot of the S sound yep. from most of the tracks because you really only need one or two there. Mm. Uh, and or I'll, or I'll line them up. Mm. And that's that's one thing that I encourage doing is 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 going through once you have all the vocals and you've comped all the best parts together. Mm. Uh, is is to go through them syllable by syllable. And I, I, I encourage the vocalists to sing in tune to capture it without having to retune things. Mm. But sometimes there's a slight intonation clash with an instrument or another background vocal or something like that, mm. and you need to fix it. But... I'm not a big believer in auto tune, uh, as as like a set it and forget it kind of thing. Sure. Um, in terms of repairing uh, intonation, but I'll go in and manually, one syllable at a time, yes. through the entire song on every single vocal, mm. manually adjust any intonation problems, mm. reduce the beginnings of s's or. Hard T's have a very wet sound to them, and if it's a ballad, mm. uh, by the time you mix it and master it, those hard T's will start sounding offensive, mm. and it'll make it hard to get the vocals on top of the mix. Mm -hmm. yep. So like one of the tips for getting the vocals on top of the mix is to go through and soften up the beginning of those T's, mm -hmm. or, and CH's have a hard ch, you know, yep. Yep. that. And... Sometimes vocalists sing have a little of an R sound in their T's, mm -hmm. so they're like, like a whistly. Yep. I can't do it, and I'm not a vocalist. But, but you've, uh, heard, you've heard enough to know. I'll go in, you know, manually and clean those up. Yep. Because the one setting won't won't do the trick. Yep. Um, do you just do that in a timeline, or do you use any specialist plugins? I. Uh, I don't understand the question. So how, how are you kind of um, messing with the intonation in your DAW? Oh, well, I just, I just, I just go into each syllable yep. and that needs correction. They don't all need sure. correction. And, and I'll highlight that section mm. and then tune it. The lip, we're talking degrees of like we're talking uh, amounts of tuning like 0. 0.05 hundredths yeah, of right. a half of a half step <laughs> yeah and 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 for whatever reason i've been blessed with an ear where i can hear these things mm -hmm. and a lot of times even the vocalists themselves are like why are you wasting time it's fine it's mm -hmm. fine it's fine it's like yeah but it could be great <laughs> it, the thing is, is let's put the effort in now mm -hmm to make everything great, no weak links anywhere in the song, mm. because, because once you've done that, it requires no additional effort to maintain for the rest of your life, you know, <laughs> the beauty of automation. You know? um, so, so you got to check yourself and make sure that you don't get lazy because mm. you want to finish yep. and just feel finished, feel mm. done. Mm. So that's like another human aspect of producing, and this is where a lot of the objectivity comes in, mm. is uh, especially if you're producing yourself, 
you have got to put your ego down and be honest with yourself mm-hmm. and you know mm-hmm. play the music once it's done play it for other people mm-hmm. and don't ask them like do you like this everyone will say yes because they don't want to offend you and that doesn't give you any information mm-hmm. but just play it don't even say it's your song and 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 look and see if their toes start tapping or if their neck starts popping if if the music is affecting them on that subconscious level and if it's not then maybe it's time to you know Yep. in fact you do that if it's really bad someone within 30 or 40 seconds in the room is going to say what is this crap turn this off (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's always that subtle sign isn't there <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a technique for finding out not if your music is good but if it's not good you know uh, yeah. what well, are you, uh, kind of, just on uh, that point like when you when you're at home and you're producing yourself and you're a vocalist and you're finding your own voice like any tips um, I guess on that front you know because there's plenty of producers out there who are also trying their hand at vocals and um, they want to find their own distinctive voice either through um, exploring um, the performance but also the gear that they use. Is there any tips you've got for aspiring producer slash vocalists? Yeah, um, you got to take breaks and it's, it's a good idea to lay down lots of takes in a row without judgment mm. And then listen to them the next day after you've slept on it and walked away from it. And then comp together. Take the, take the best parts or the parts that work the best together. Mm. And that will give you more objectivity. And then also it's a great way to create a dynamic performance. Mm. That's an amalgam of all the performances. Mm. You have so much more control by doing it that way. Mm. If you're trying to like perfect it, listen back, perfect it, listen back, perfect it, you're getting no objectivity. Mm. And then when you listen to it the next day, mm. you're going to hear things that you're going to want to, you know, recut or redo mm. anyway. Mm. So, so it's a good idea to take breaks, take long breaks, walk away, come back, mm. maybe even stagger things, work on your vocals one day, mm. and then maybe work on some of the music on the track for the next mm. day or two. And then come back and listen to the vocals and work on vocals more. Mm-hmm. Instead of doing all vocals mm-hmm. and all music and all overdubs and you know, it's good to jump around. Yep. Good to jump around. That'll give give you some objectivity and keep things a little fresher, keep things yep. from getting stale. Yeah. And when a new artist comes to you, Joe, um, do they mostly with their vocal performance, for example, is it um, you know, if they've spent years potentially singing into a microphone at home or, and and they've spent years kind of, I guess, uh, getting used to a sound, um, even if it's the reverb they might use or the compression they might use. Um, or the reverb in the bathroom that they're used to. Sure. You know. <laughs> um, so, like, it, it, do you find that um, you have to go with that, I guess, how they are hearing themselves um, after years of spending time you know, uh, producing themselves or do you try and explore a new Vista vocally for them? Well, if what they're doing sounds great, I don't see any reason to mess with it. You know, Mm. if it sounds good, it is good. Mm. That's from the Joe Solo constitution. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'll talk more about that later. Good. I'll I'll plug my products later. Yeah, yeah, please Um, do. But, uh, um, but, Usually that's not the case. Hmm. Otherwise, uh, I'm duplicating something amateurish. Hmm. And uh, the thing is, is that, you know, reverb and delay, it can mask mistakes and problems that might not be apparent to the vocalist when they're just singing at home, you know, around the house or what have Hmm. you. Mm. Or like I said earlier, like if they're if they're not using appropriate mics for vocals, mm. uh, you know, a lot of times people are singing in clubs and they use these old Shure SM58s and they've been mm. pounded on the ground and spit on for years and all kinds of stuff and and that that's not going to pick up all the 
articulations that the human voice is capable of making. Mm. But with the ultra-sensitive mics uh, that I tend to use on vocals, they're, they're going to pick up everything. Mm. You know, they, those, those mics don't lie. So, mm. again, you got to be honest with yourself with what you're hearing. Mm. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what, are you, what's, what have you learned over the decades as far as setting uh, a vocalist up with um, a headphone mix and what they think they need and what they really need to get a good performance? Well, I don't, I, I don't want to give them too much delay and reverb for the very reason I just mentioned is it masks mistakes. Hmm. And, and, um, but I'll give them a little, a little tiny bit so they can feel natural hmm. if, if they want it. Um, you know, I think it's important to have a really pristine uh, signal path. Now, everything, of course, starts with the writing of the song and the vocalist's interpretation of that, whether they wrote it themselves or somebody else wrote it or a combination. Mm -hmm. And so you really, you really got to get a great performance coming out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. But then at that point, it's important to have uh, uh, high quality and appropriate mics because there's not like one vocal mic that you just use for all vocals different styles and different dynamics and different ways of singing and rapping uh, will call for different microphones. Mm. But uh, usually it's going to be um, a high-quality condenser mic. And then uh, my, my signal path is deceptively simple. Uh, I go through uh, the... Highest quality cabling, Mogami cables. Good, yep. And uh, the whole studio is wired with Mogami. Mm. It's the only way to go. Mm. All right. <laughs> and um, they just sound, they're the best sounding cables, and it does make a difference. Uh, I go into uh, Neve 1272 preamp. Yep. And those are real simple, too. All they have are two volume knobs per channel on it, and input and output, and that's mm. it. Mm. And then I go through this great piece of gear called the um, Empirical Labs Fatso Junior. Yep. What this is, for the, those who don't know, it's kind of this esoteric combination compressor tape saturator simulation. But the compression circuits work with the saturation circuits. Right. So... You have to sort of experiment to dial it in, but mm. once you do, mm. it take, it warms the signal extra warm. The Neve already warms it up, and then it makes it extra warm and takes away the digital brittleness mm. that, that can often accompany uh, uh, vocals when you're recording at home. Mm. And then that's it. Straight mm. into the computer. I've got a... Uh, you know, you have to have a good converter. Mm. And if you're using multiple pieces of digital gear, you need a good clock to tie it all together. Mm. So uh, I like Apogee's. You know, you get a lot of bang for the buck. Yes. And they sound great. Mm. Yes. I have I have a piece of gear that I use an Apogee Track 2, which they don't even make anymore. Mm. Uh, but uh, that's my... That's my signal path. Mm. And that's it. Mm. I don't. I don't EQ it going in. I don't print it with for vocals. I don't print it with reverbs or delays or anything like that. I do all that after the fact. Yep. Uh, then again, in the spirit of experimentation, I suppose mm. one could do that to experiment with the concept of committing to a sound. Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway, that's that's mm. my signal path, mm. and 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 the mic is key. Yes. Now, when I was first starting out, and I was using a lot of uh, you know lower cost recording formats, mm. I would still rent a microphone that was high quality and a yep. high quality preamp when I did my vocals. It would cost me forty bucks for the day. And they would come out sounding great. Mm. And people were like, how did you get such great sound, you know, out of this, you know, 
cassette A track. That's right. <laughs> it's like, well, because people who people people who have lower grade gear tend to get lower grade mics. Mm, sure. But now, you know, the computer is the great equalizer. We all have access to great gear. Yep. Um, but not always need, great mics. Yeah, you need you need a great mic. Mm. Good preamp. A little bit of compression. Yep. Don't over compress, of course, because you can't undo mm. uh, compression. Um, so, Joe, uh, not everybody can afford, you know, the two or three thousand um, dollar U forty seven. I'm not sure how many, how much U forty seven goes for uh, at the moment um, post Corona, but. Um, <laughs> how does uh, how, 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 how some some gear really quick, <laughs> some low cost gear and stock up some more. Yeah. Um, how do how do you um, advise aspiring artists to um, choose a vocal mic that um, isn't going to break the bank but gets them a decent result? Um, a lot of my producer buddies and I we have a secret weapon. And it's mind blowing because these microphones are so low cost, you can't believe how good they sound. But there's this company called MXL. Oh, yes. Uh, that makes amazing sounding mics. And we're talking like in the 99 to 199 range. And uh, I use those on vocals maybe 80. 85, 90% of the time, mm. Mm. and, and not the, th the $3,000 Neumann, although occasionally I use that if, if it sounds better, whatever sounds best with whatever vocalist. Mm. And, you know, a vocalist should go, go to a, a music store and really, you know, try out different mics and hear mm. how they sound. Mm. So they'll feel the difference in, in how the mic works with their voice and whether it's warm enough mm. or if they're like, you know, a very hardcore rapper or like a, you know, uh, a, a death metal singer. Yep. They're going to they're not going to want a mic that Celine Dion would use. Sure. Right. Uh, <laughs> so they're going to they're going to they're going to want something that can handle the, the air pressure that they're putting out. Sure. Um. Yep. So it's good to test those things out. Yep. But MXL makes some really great uh, microphones for low cost. Uh, I don't get paid from them. I don't get a commission or anything like that. I'm just, I should do. <laughs> I'm really a, a fan of the bang up for the buck that yeah, you get yeah. out of them. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, there's, then, um, there's a few um, that do it really well, isn't that? Um, Rode have obviously got a... A few that um, are really amazing value, and same with Audio Technica. And um, but yeah, MXL is definitely um, definitely maybe a little less known than those two names, and does some great mics. Um, so, Joe, famously, your Cinderella story started with <laughs> a unknown nobody um, who was. Um, I think working in a restaurant at the time, and you had a chance meeting, um, and you developed this nobody into a, a, a international superstar. Do you mind telling me that story? Because um, I think it, it's a fascinating insight into you know learning a craft as a producer and actually sort of making it in the music industry. Yeah, uh, you're referring to Macy Gray, and this was back around the. Um, well, she broke through. It was a while back, around two thousand. Around the year 2000 or so. Mm. Um, but we had actually started working in 1985. So I sort of chuckled when you said Cinderella story. Uh, let's see, it was 2002. Uh, so, yeah, that's 17 years before the Cinderella story happened of, right. of, uh, of, of trial and error and successes and heartbreaks yeah. and... So 17 year is, overnight success, as they say. But I made a commitment when I was like 14. I decided I was going to make music my life, and I made a commitment to quite simply never quit. 
mm. no matter what. Mm. And, and, and that, that, that is my motto. And that's my, the best advice I could give anyone in music is don't quit ever. Mm. And, you know, um, you don't want to be on your deathbed going, ah, I wonder if I had put some more effort into that. What, you know, mm, what could, could, my have, could my music have moved thousands of people or millions of people? And, and, and sure, it's great to make good money and all that, but there is like nothing more satisfying mm. to an artist mm. uh, or a producer or a singer, musician, than like being at a red light. And this actually happened to me. And then, like, this car full of cute girls in a convertible pulled up next to me. And one of the songs I, I co-wrote with Macy, the song called Sweet Baby, was, like, blasting over the stereo. It was on the radio. Mm. Uh, it was on Kiss FM, which was, like, the hit radio station in L.A. Mm. And I couldn't resist. And I was, you know, and and I, I, I put the window down. I was like, hey, ladies. And they're looking at me like, who's this jerk? And I'm like, I wrote that song. And they were like, really? And I was like, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, I'm, I'm glad they believed you. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I was, uh, who would lie about that? You know, well, that's true. <laughs> um, but then, but then there's the converse experience. You, when you're late at night shopping for groceries at 3 a.m. at the 24-hour grocery store across the street, mm. and your song comes on in the background music, mm. and there's nobody around to share the moment with, except maybe <laughs> like the guy who's like restocking the shelves or something like that. And you're like, hey, dude, I wrote that. And the guy looks at you like, so? <laughs> Why are you talking to me? <laughs> and I'm like, of course, like, see, senor, good job. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, That's great. But uh, it, it's, it's, sat it's satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, like my, my kids, who are older teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, are they're not impressed with anything I've ever done. Any, you know, not anything. What is a guy going to do? When they were younger, I was reading my royalty statement, and I do. I have a lot of music in like TV shows and film and stuff like that, and, yep. and a, a lot, a lot of it's vocal, and a lot of it's instrumental. Yep. So, uh, I guess my my publisher had placed some music of mine with this show called The Dog Whisperer. If you know that show, it's it's a it's a really big show. It's about this this guy who teaches families how to raise their dogs. Oh, okay, gotcha. And yep. Kids love this show because mm. kids love dogs, mm -hmm. and so did my daughters. So I'm reading my royalty statement, and I'm like, oh, looks like I had some music on the Dog Whisperer. And they're like, oh, the Dog Whisperer. Oh my God, Dad's famous. And they're running around, just like when they're like eight years old. They're like running around and jumping on the couch. And I was, I'm not like, so yeah, your dad is finally cool, right? And one of my daughters puts her arm on my shoulder and says, yeah, dad, you just keep telling yourself that. <laughs> yeah. And the cool <laughs> to the uh, ultimate reality check. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, so I met Macy Gray. She was a cashier at this restaurant called Larry Parker's Beverly Hills Diner. Yep. And um, I was paying my bill. And, you know, this is like 1985. Mm. Now, guitar is my primary instrument. And at the time, if you played guitar, you had long hair. Sure. And you looked, you looked the part. And um, Spandex pants? No, I was more of a Duran Duran kind of style as opposed to the heavy metal thing. Okay, right, right. Um, as a guitarist, I'm... Although I can shred, I'm much more about melody and saying things with as few notes as possible. Okay, the David Gilmore Post style in school. He's my biggest <laughs> influence right there. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Um, so, so I looked the part, and she just asked me out of the blue as I'm paying my bill, hey, are you a musician? I'm like, yeah, I play guitar and a bunch of instruments, and I produce. And she's like, well, really? I'm a vocalist, so we should work together. And I'm thinking, okay, just out of the blue, this this trippy chick with a wispy voice suddenly proposes that we should work together. Why not? You know? So the next day we got together, and she's, like, warming up in in the vocal booth at my home studio at the time. And, yep. of course, the vocal booth is a euphemism for bathroom. Sure. And uh, but she's warming up, 
And after about four or five minutes, I get on the talk back like, and I'm like, could you come out here for a second? And she comes out like, what's the problem? And I said, I will commit right now, no matter how long it takes and no matter what we have to do to be your producer, your musical director, your partner, songwriting partner until we make it big. And I will never, ever quit on you until that day comes. Mm. So, yeah, wow. 17 years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, came um, overnight we, success. <laughs> yeah, we broke through. It, it, was, it was crazy. It was like yeah. uh, the A&R lady uh, from uh, Sony called and said, um, you know, we're, we're going to make your song Sweet Baby the lead single on the follow-up to our first record. We're going to do the MTV video, the whole thing. We're putting all the money and the marketing money into that. Mm. And then she says, um, and I'm like, well, great. Mm. <laughs> and she says, do you mind if I call some producer, uh, some publisher buddies of mine mm. and have them talk to you about possibly doing a publishing deal? Mm -hmm. uh, for those who are listening who don't know, publishing is the term for the stock in the intellectual property known as a song mm -hmm. or composition. So um, it's good to learn about those things, too. Uh, but anyway, so I'm like, yeah, I'd love that. And then, you know, within 10 minutes, the phone is ringing off the hook all day. And I got calls from just about every major publisher in the States and a few from overseas. Mm. And uh, a bidding war started between mm. EMI, Warner Chapel, and Famous Music, which was uh, at the time was Paramount Pictures music publishing division sure. and everybody's like afraid to make the first bid mm. but finally somebody does yep and it was like 75,000 I was like okay that's great and then the next one comes in and they up it to 125 and it's a bidding war yeah wow and then one comes up to 175 I'm like hey great well that became too rich for one of them so one of them dropped out and others dropped out and then Ultimately, it was down to two, yep. EMI, which at the time was like just th this huge conglomerate, you know, mm -hmm. um, with hundreds of writers. Mm -hmm. Then there was Famous Music, which was sort of like a combination boutique publishing firm, but with the weight of a major because they're backed by Paramount. Sure. But they only had 20 writers, mm -hmm. and they wanted to make wanted to make me the, the the head writer producer for pop rock and hip hop. Yep. So uh, I went with I went with them. Yep. And uh, at that point, the advance was up to uh, oh, it was up, it was up to about three hundred twenty thousand dollars. And people go, <laughs> but wait a second, for seventeen years, how many hours did I put in? You know. If you look at my hourly for the past 17 years, I wasn't even doing better than a McDonald's French fry cook after taxes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but still, like that's oh. that's. I guess was that the moment that you, it all hit you that life had changed. Yeah, it was the most exciting and most scariest time mm -hmm. of my life, um, uh, because. Well, it's exciting because you break through, and then you're like, "Oh no, I'm I'm a rookie now, again," and I, you know it's a whole different set of customs and rules and secret handshakes on the inside, and that's that's one of the things that I've noticed. A lot of people have an idea of how the industry works prior to them being inside the industry to know how it really works. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time with my uh, music success workshop division of my production company teaching people how to be successful in music. Sure. Yep. Uh, one thing I do is I send out these free video nuggets and tips, much like mm. some of the tips that I'm giving here mm. uh, every week. If someone wants to get those, it doesn't cost anything. Mm. They can go to josolo.com mm. and sign up, and they'll get their first uh, – They'll get a video nugget uh, called How to Get Your Music in Film and TV, mm -hmm. which is one of the best mm -hmm. ways to break through nowadays. Yep. Because there's lots of avenues 
uh, for getting placements in film and TV that that weren't available. A lot of song plugging companies, mm. you know, have have developed and have come up. Mm. Um, mm. And uh, mm. when you have a placement in film and TV, it, it's it it lasts forever because like those movies and TV shows. They play in different territories and on different mediums, mm -hmm. cable and streaming and broadcasting, and then they go into syndication. Mm -hmm. I got a friend, he did the music for Seinfeld, which, <laughs> which ran for like seven or eight seasons, was one of the most popular shows of its time, and now is in syndication forever. Yep. And he, re he retired at 45 mm -hmm. uh, and and still enjoy such massive royalty checks. Uh, it's insane. Yeah, well, so, I mean, well, the amount of money one placement or one hit song can make is mm, unbelievable. Mm, but it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of luck yes. to get that. But there's so many things you could do to tip the luck factor in your favor. Sure. Sure. And so that's why I'm speaking around the world at conventions and putting on retreats and sending out tips and selling products that give insider information that you couldn't know about it unless you've already done it. Because yep. I always wish that I had someone like me to help guide me mm. when I was starting out and I didn't know anything yep. and I thought I did. Yeah, sure. So tell, yeah. Me, tell me about Make It Big in a Box. Uh, Make It Big in a Box is a, a collection uh, of about, uh, well, I think it's about... 14 hours of, of video, uh, hundreds of written tips, a book, and a handful of other things, and all the information you need to be to maximize your, your chances of success in music. Mm -hmm. And then it also comes uh, with a one-hour uh, live or Skyped consultation with me. Mm, cool. Um, and right now we're pre-selling it for... Uh, nine hundred and ninety-seven dollars at JoeSolo.com. Mm. We're still putting it, still putting it all together. Okay. But if anybody does the pre-sell, they it actually goes for two thousand normally. They're going to get it at half price, and I'll drip some content to them right away, uh, directly, so they can get started and get working on their careers the the very night they sign up. Cool, that's good. Yep, that sounds awesome. Yeah, we're, yeah. So, online programs out there and uh, all all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So I encourage everybody to head along to joesolo.com and um, sign up to the newsletter. And um, Have you got a Facebook page as well, Joe? Yeah, it's uh, Joe Solo and the number one. Um, just because sure. somebody else took Joe Solo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to point out, I think a real interesting part of my website is if you go to the production area, yep. there's a page of before and afters where you can hear the demo that an artist brought me that they created yep. of their material, and then the fully polished broadcast quality master uh, that I produced as a result of being hired by them. And you can really hear what a seasoned producer really brings to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Instead of just playing the finished thing, show what it was first, then show what it is now, and you get a sense of what a seasoned producer can do. Yeah, for sure. And to become seasoned, anyone can become seasoned. It just takes a good 10 to 20,000 hours of practice. <laughs> and and if you're dedicated and you love it and you live it and you put in those hours, your intuitions about arrangement and music and what, what makes a good take and what are good mixes, they get, they, they get honed really nice and your ear gets really sharp. Um, like, for example, uh, I would say 75% of the time when I'm editing and mixing, I'm using a simple four-band EQ. Mm. And, and I can carve out so many different tonalities with that, mm. clean things up, make them sound better, mm. enhance them, affect them. There's so many things you could do with an EQ, yeah. but you have to have the ear to be able to dial that in properly, and that just comes with practice and experience. Sure. sure. And that's so. That's one of the things that I would encourage people who are maybe self-producing on their home setup. Uh, 
to do is to really experiment with the EQ and learn how it affects different instruments and tonalities and how you can balance them together and mix them together. Mm. For example, uh, let's say you want to push up the vocals in the mix, but they're sounding a little harsh. Mm. Usually that means there's a little too much 2K mm. in the vocal because that's the most irritating range uh, for humans to hear human voices. Mm. So you roll off a little 2K and then all of a sudden mm. you can pump up an extra decibel or two out of the vocal and get it to sit on top of the mix mm. instead of buried inside. Mm. Mm. For sure. So it's a, it's a lot of it's training your ears. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. time. Yeah. Out of time. Mm. It's good, Joe. Hey, um, we'll leave it there and I'll let you get on with the rest of your day. Um, but thanks so much for your time. <laughs> and um, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been fun. So um, until Happy next time. Happy to do it any time. <laughs> and remember, everybody, don't quit. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Cool. Cool. See Thanks, Christopher. Really appreciate it. Not at all. See you later.